Without further, further ado, I would like to invite Governor Josh Green to address you today. Hello everyone, Mayor, great to be with you. And I'm uh, just going to bring uh, people up to speed with a few basic updates. We have a lot of uh, extraordinary experts here today. So here we are, it's been 10 weeks since the, the disaster uh, that occurred here on Maui. Uh, we lost 99 of our loved ones. We still uh, have some work to do uh, to close, I think, the six remaining cases. And uh, we pray every day that uh, there are no more loved ones that we've lost. So uh, we do appreciate uh, how difficult this has been. It has been tragic. Uh, in addition to that, it has had a very large impact on our people across the, uh, across the board. We've had so many people displaced. We know that we have over 3,000 families that were displaced. As of uh, yesterday, approximately 6,800 individuals were still in hotel rooms across 35 hotels. Hundreds of families now in Airbnbs, in our HHFDC program. People are now moving into the Mayor's Excellent program, uh, which he'll be sharing. Uh, so we're making a lot of progress, but it is going to be a very long process. And what we want to share with people is we are here till the very end to get people into stable housing so that for the long-term recovery, the very long-term recovery, we can be ready. We can be ready to heal. A couple other things I wanted to share. Uh, just under 9,000 of our individuals became unemployed. That number is beginning to drop. As of last week, it was 8,773. Uh, Jimmy Tokyoka, my DBED director, will share how that number has begun to decline. We did announce the opening on uh, for October 8th. It was, as we expected, a very gentle opening. Very few additional people have come, but we're mindful that that will have an impact on us going forward, which is why we have to be steady. Steady getting people into housing, steady making sure people can return to their lives. Also, this has been a big week because we returned to school, and we were very grateful to see a lot of people celebrate going back to school. But even so, we're understanding if people aren't ready yet, and that's also important. One of the messages is we are going to be understanding if people aren't ready to work yet, and they still need more time. If they're not ready to move yet, we will find a way to get them into a stable place in their life, and when they're ready to go back to education or to the other parts of their lives, we'll accommodate that. You'll see some significant uh, changes and improvements to resources in the coming days. On the 20th of this month, a large operation to get grants through the TANF program will open up with MEO, Maui Economic Opportunity. Those grants will be applied for through them. We have set aside already $50 million with the additional $50 million coming as soon as it's required or needed. That's important. That could get people grants up to $30,000 to help buy a car in addition to the resources they get from FEMA and American Red Cross and so many other humanitarian efforts. That's important. It can also be used for first and last month's rent. It can be used for a lot of things. So you'll see that. Now later this week, uh, early next week, I'll go to Washington uh, to see the president again, to see the leadership in D.C., to make sure they understand the support we need to give to our mayor. So not only seeing President Biden, but I'll also be able to see the HUD secretary. In time, that will be very important because that resource will come to the mayor so he can build a lot of housing, as is decided by him and the community and he set up a process that he'll describe. That's also very important. So I'll see the HUD secretary, the White House, infrastructure personnel, health and human service personnel. The mayor and I discussed yesterday where our priorities and responsibilities should lie. My responsibilities will continue to be working with the federal government, working with both FEMA and their leadership, who I'll also see with the Red Cross bringing grants. Meanwhile, I'll also focus on health care and economic development and our environmental concerns, which our Department of Health is able to deal with. The mayor, who has to rebuild community, will be the point person for housing. And he has many solutions for the people, but he is closest. He is closest to the needs of individuals one by one and has the heart for that. And so he will be able to help people rebuild and restructure where they live. So what I think I will do is just uh, mahalo people because it has been so difficult. And we understand that. We absolutely do. There are going to be decisions, like in any crisis, that are hard. There are decisions that we'll have to be understanding when people aren't ready for them. But we move forward, and we're going to do all that we can to help people heal. You have a great team here. 
And if I may, I'm going to pause there so that our other experts can address the community uh, and talk about how these plans are going to unfold. Hello. Mahalo, Governor Green. Next, I'd like to introduce Maui County Mayor Richard Bisson. Aloha. We know from talking to our residents the anxiety and the uncertainty that they feel when it comes to the topic of housing. I appreciate uh, Governor mentioning the county will take point on getting our folks into stable housing, safe, secure. Uh, we have some, some milestones and some landmarks that we do want to reach in this. Uh, we want to focus on getting people into not just stable housing, but an interim housing uh, when they are ready to leave the hotels. Uh, that's not going to be an easy process. We understand that. We're trying everything possible uh, and doing all that we can to make that happen through the work that's already been set forth by uh, Director Tokioka and, and his folks uh, building upon the Airbnb uh, rentals. But we're also going to focus on the host family program, which we talked about already uh, in a previous um, press conference. That host family program, I just want to stress, what it talks about is um, having existing inventory, families that are already taking in other family or friends or uh, fellow co-workers. Uh, we want to reward them by giving them uh, funding to help with that. Uh, this is a good program because it's statewide. You can be in any county in the state of Hawaii and qualify for this host family program. Uh, we want to use the services of the Red Cross to get that word out to the folks that are staying at our various properties, as, as Governor mentioned, the hotels. Uh, so we're going to make a better effort of uh, getting that word out to our folks, which is already starting. Um, again, that program, uh, we also plan on making it retroactive. In other words, paying families up to $1,500 a month if they've taken people in since August 8th. Uh, the other thing we want to talk about is the rental assistance, thanks to the work of FEMA. Uh, of course, uh, the GEM program doing uh, rent abatement. Uh, there are other programs, of course, the topic of modular homes has come up, and we are discussing that and looking into how that can be not only a short-term, uh, but eventually a long-term solution, meaning if we're going to lay infrastructure down on our island, uh, we're going to make sure we put it somewhere that we can make use of it after the temporary structures are taken down. So again, all part of a, of a larger strategy uh, that we're working with many, many others uh, who uh, know about this kind of work or who have suffered this kind of tragedy in their community. I'll also make myself available for questions uh, later. Thank you. Mahalo, Mayor Bissen. Next, I'd like to introduce FEMA's Regional Administrator, Bob Fenton. Aloha. Um, the administration uh, continues to support ongoing operations here with a number of federal agencies that are here with FEMA to support uh, the state of Hawaii and the county. And even more important than that, and I've talked many times about it, it really takes a coalition, is having in that coalition not only government, but private nonprofits, uh, private sector, and even those that are affected be part of that team. And to have uh, Gail here from the Red Cross, McGovern, is really a key part of that. They've been such a key partner to FEMA in responding to this event and all events across the United States. So it's great to have her here, here today. Um, one of the things that we're really focused on, as uh, Mayor talked about, was supporting the housing mission. And we've already given rental assistance to almost 3,300 people uh, thus far. That rental assistance is two months of rent uh, based on the fair market rental rate. Uh, for based on how many bedrooms they had before. They've, uh, those 3,300 people have received that. They could go out and rent a unit. We know that it's a difficult uh, rental market here, so what we're doing is providing assistance, working with uh, nonprofit organizations uh, and private sector to help them find that and also to assist in providing additional funds that you're hearing about here today from other organizations. Once they rent something in FEMA, if you're part of that program and you're one of those 3,300 people, you can ask for extensions uh, in three-month increments. And what we did is, based on the high cost of rent here, we increased it from 100% fair market rental rate to 175%. Uh, that should provide the necessary funds to continue to rent, and we can provide those funds up to 18 months. So we want to help individuals rent as much as possible. We realize that some may need additional help, and in some cases, we'll direct lease uh, properties. 
and ask, act as a landlord to sublease to individuals. In some cases, as the mayor said, we may have to build temporary solutions, and we're looking at those and have our engineers, along with other federal entities, working on some of those solutions. But we remain committed. In addition to the housing, we're doing things to focus on preparing Lahaina for wherever the future of the vision, the vision is for Lahaina, to help remove the hazards, remove the debris. And to date, the administration, just in FEMA funding here, has spent almost $1 billion, $1 billion in responding to this event. This is just the beginning. We'll be here uh, until the job gets done, until we get people into safe, stable housing, and until we work with the county and the state to rebuild the Haina. Thank you. Mahalo, Bob. I'd like to introduce American Red Cross President and CEO, Gil McGovern. Aloha and thank you, everyone. Um, I want to start by saying my heart goes out to the people that were impacted by the, this fire. It's heartbreaking. People lost everything. People lost loved ones. And the American Red Cross is doing everything possible that we can to try to soften the blow. Um, we are working closely with state and state government, FEMA, the Maui uh, mayor. Um, this is going to take a lot of players to make sure that we get people back on their feet. And you heard about a mosaic of different types of housing. Um, we will provide case management and, and get people into housing as it becomes available. In the meantime, as uh, the government governor mentioned, there are 6,800 people in hotels. We have case managers in those hotels. We're taking care of them to the best of our ability. Um, people tell us their stories. They have a catharsis. We're, t we're taking care of them and doing the best we can with them. Um, and we do have experience with having people in hotels and getting people back in their feet this way. Um, something that I'm very excited about is that we are hiring people in the community um, to be able to be employees of the Red Cross to help us with this project. And the reason I'm excited about it is these people know the community. They know the streets. They know what's going on. They have cultural sensitivity. We've already hired over 100 people, and we've just started, so that number is going to grow. The other thing is we have volunteers that just spontaneously jump in to help, and it's part of the Aloha spirit. They show up. They see a need. They want to fill it. So we have a lot of spontaneous volunteers that are helping us as well. We've given out a lot of financial assistance so far, uh, $11.3 million um, to about 5,000 households. So we're getting people jump-started. And uh, for people that are truly vulnerable and need it the most, we're in the process of giving another round. Uh, $3.4 million has been given out already only in just two days. So um, we're here to help. Uh, Red Crossers are born to help, and they see a need, and they just need to fill it. And I'm proud to be a part of it. And again, my heart goes out to everyone who is suffering from this tragedy. Thank you. Mahalo, Gail. Next, please welcome the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism's Director, Jimmy Tokioka. Aloha and good afternoon. Aloha. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the team here, and I really mean the team because it, it is a great team. Um, I'm around uh, a lot of people for all the years that I've been in government, but this team that has been working under the direction of Governor Green and uh, Director Fenton has been incredible. I can tell you that um, there's not a night that goes by or a day that goes by that not everybody is working together to help the people of Lahaina because it was so tragic. So for on the, I'll start with the housing side. The governor asked me to take the lead on moving people from their uh, congregate shelters into hotels and we were very, very fortunate because we had a few hotels and I've said it in a few press conferences that stepped up without even a contract from Gail and her team and Bob and his team, they stepped up and they brought people into their properties. And the two properties are the Royal Lahaina and the Kanapali Beach outrigger. Um, they did an awesome job. 
I don't know too many people who would do that, but they did. And they've been continually doing that. Uh, the Royal Haina will be a, a hotel that if the, sh the survivors want to stay, they can stay. And, and many of those rooms have kitchens. So that's what we're trying to do now. And um, Mayor Bisson, I promise you, we're not walking away from it. We're going to continue to give the resources um, as if um, we were still doing it, but with your guidance and with your team's guidance. And um, we want to make sure that, that the survivors have a more comfortable place to live with a kitchen, with a parking space, with a place to walk their dogs. And, and we will not end. The governor won't let me sleep. He texts me at 4.30 in the morning until we get that done. <laughs> um, on the economic recovery side, I will let you know that I've been working very, very well with uh, the direct, your Director of Economic Development, Luana Mahi. Um, she shared with me some plans that they have for the line of businesses yesterday. It was a video clip that is incredible. You should be very proud of, of what you folks are going to do to help Maui businesses. And all of the people that I've spoken with because of my position at economic, at, as the economic development director of the state, um, the people that I speak to in Lahaina, they, they are craving for something like that. So the program, um, I know she's going to do a great job. So I have a lot of statistics that I could share. But what I will say to you is that there are two very, very good websites. It's the dbedhawaii.gov and the maorirecovers.org. .org, right, Mayor? Yes. .org. Those two websites, for any statistic that you want, go to that website and you can get as much information as you, you could possibly imagine. Um, we are going to be working with Debbie Kabibi at MEO on some of the forgivable loans that um, the state is going to be putting out uh, in, uh, in conjunction with the county. So we're looking forward to that because the businesses that are, are struggling are really going to need that help. So it's going to be an opportunity for us to help them. And as I said earlier, this is something that uh, we think about every single day. There's not a day that goes on that we don't do that. So thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank the, in the interpreter for su supporting so that the deaf community can understand what we are talking about. Thank you very, very much. Hello. Mahalo, Director Tokioka. Finally, I'd like to welcome Department of Human Services Deputy Director Joe Campos. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. Uh, thank you to Governor Green for the support that he's given to the Department of Human Services. Governor Green and the Department of Human Services has worked tirelessly to ensure that we can provide people impacted by the wildfires, both on Maui as well as Hawaii Island, the critical support that they need to restore their lives and repair and heal. The department has worked with our TANF reserves to be able to mobilize up to $100 million, which will go to support families. We have partnered with Maui Economic Opportunity Thank you, Debbie. Um, Maui Economic Opportunity has worked tirelessly, tirelessly to ensure that we are able to start accepting applications for this program this Friday, October 20th. We also want to thank the County of Maui uh, for their support as we roll this out. We also want to share the fact that this is for dependent uh, families with dependent children we encourage you if you have a, if you have been impacted by the wildfires to please apply let the department of human services and maui economic opportunity determine your eligibility we do not want you to go without the opportunities that exist for you and i'll be able to answer any questions thank you Mahalo, Deputy Director Campos. Now I would like to open the, the floor up uh, for questions from the media. I'd like to remind everyone that we welcome all questions, but we do ask for your aloha and kindness in asking them. Please raise your hand and await my acknowledgement, Kalamai, at which time I will ask you to state your name and news organization. Then you can proceed with asking your question. Just give me a beat. I'm going to repeat it back so that everybody tuning in can understand what the question is, and then whoever your question is for can come up and answer. Mapopo? Let's start. Wendy? 
with the Osher Pacific Media Group in Maui now. The question is for Mr. Tokioka about the return of tourism. It's been about 10 days. Can you give us a, uh, an overview of where we stand right now? Is there a significant increase in tourism or is it just kind of a slow, gradual return? Mahalo, Wendy. Wendy's question is around 10 days post the um, October 8th reopening, a status update from Director Tokioka. Thank you, uh, Debbie. Well, let me just start with um, the October 8th date. Um, a lot of thought went into that by the governor and the mayor. And um, the information that we got, I meet with the hotel operators every single week, sometimes twice a week. So I would constantly ask them what their reservations look like because it's important to us to figure out where we need to be and how we need to get there. So every time I have these meetings, I communicate with the governor uh, what the status is like. Um, one of the questions that happened when the governor made the announcement to open on October 8th, every other day I was calling the hotels to find out what their occupancy was, what their reservations patterns were, and it was down. In fact, some of the hotels lost reservations after the governor's announcement. So we knew there wasn't going to be a big influx of, of visitors coming. We also knew that some of the timeshare properties, uh, the, the guests would come because they owned the week, but we did also know that a lot of people have moved their week to another time during the year um, at the resort that they were at. So we were well aware of what the, the circumstances were going to be. Um, you know, we, we also asked them in the first quarter, what was your reservation patterns looking like? And they continuously tell us it's down. Um, the only month that they have some concerns is December. And there's a few weeks in December, but I'm very proud of the people that we're working with because what they're telling us is that, Jimmy, we'll work with each other to figure out if, if um, one hotel is uh, in need of rooms, we'll figure out how we can do it. So I give a lot of credit to the, to the properties that are in there. And for the most part, there are some that are um, way better than others, but for the most part, um, the major ones are working well together. And I, and I give them a lot of aloha because um, Every time we ask them for support, they say, you know, it's, it's our people too. It's their employees that they're helping. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I think that answers the question, but um, I appreciate the question because we put a lot of thought into how we were going to move forward with tourism. And that's why what the mayor is talking about is the vacation rentals and moving them into those uh, more comfortable living arrangements. We need to make sure that we, we can help the hotel so that they can start booking um, the regular visitors when they come back. Thank right. you. Wendy, good? Okay. Thanks for me. Chelsea, you're up. Hi. Hi. Um, Chelsea Davis with Hawaii News Now. This question is for Mayor. Um, Mayor, what is the process and how long will it take to select and develop a landfill site for the permanent disposal of non-hazardous debris from Lahaina? And where will the material be stored until that is built? So it's the process and the timeline to build a landfill site post wildfires. Mahalo, Chelsea. So we're working with our Department of Environmental Management. Um, there's going to be an agenda item with the uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources, their board, on Friday, October 27th. Uh, we'll know more at that time. Uh, but we do have a plan of keeping the non hazardous debris on island at the wishes of our Lahaina community. Uh, we understand that there may be remains that is contained within those areas. Uh, wherever we put that on Maui will only, that's the only thing that will be stored there. This will not be a landfill in the sense that anything else can be put there with it. This will be placed there solely by itself. Uh, and, and we'll have other plans for what will be done with that in the future. Um, but the plan is to leave it here on Maui. Thanks, Chuffy. Yes, Governor, of course. So, um, I, th I think it's also important to give uh, the Governor and their team great kudos. As of yesterday, they had, with, uh, in their partnership with the EPA, had cleared 1,103 lots out of about 1,500 already of some of the most um, toxic concerns. This were refrigerators and other chemicals that had to go first. Uh, before people could return. And so that also has been a very significant process. As you know, uh, last, uh, on Saturday, we did get the results back that there were heavy metals discovered in the ash in Kula. 
uh, we are obviously going to test all of the ash in all of the areas, uh, but it's very um, methodical the way the EPA approaches this. That will also affect, you know, the mayor and their team and how they best keep everything, um, I guess, organized and stable for recovery. Because long term, eventually the people will decide how they want to rebuild, how and where uh, their homes should be. And so we have to be very thoughtful about the environmental health. It was uh, arsenic that was the concern, and it has not been found in the water. It has not been a threat near the schools, but we still have to be very careful. So when people do go back to those properties uh, in advance of the full removal, we're still asking them to be safe. And so uh, this will be a constant partnership. Our Department of Health uh, team will be right there with the mayor's team and FEMA's team to make sure people don't you know, inhale or ingest any of that, um, that ash. Mahalo. Um, our next question is from Dan Nicasso with the Honolulu Star Advertiser, and this question is for Mayor Bisson. Regarding any idea of timing for Phase 2 for reopening based on Phase 1 experience? Yes, um, you know, I can say that Phase 1 has gone well, and uh, I will be getting an update from my advisory team this Friday. We meet every we meet twice a week, um, and this is uh, the topic uh, on our agenda this Friday. So I'll know more then. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, thank you. Paul Aker, Maui Alert. Uh, question is primarily for Mr. Fenton. Uh, talking to small businesses, very small businesses, they're saying that they're getting no assistance from FEMA. If they lost a house, they could get assistance, but if they lost a business, they can't. They are on the brink. What can you tell those people? The question from Paul is around small business support from FEMA. Yeah, let me go ahead and start, and I'm sure that there's others here that bring other resources to the table. Uh, FEMA's assistance is uh, really uh, geared toward residents that lost their homes, but SBA can help businesses. So once you apply to FEMA, whether you're a resident or a business owner, you're sent over to SBA to uh, get further assistance from SBA. <clears throat> There's other federal agencies here. Uh, EDA um, is here, uh, USDA, and they bring other grants that will help uh, the business community. But I'll tell you one thing the businesses could do right now is they could go fill out a right of entry, and they can fill out a right of entry to remove the debris off of their commercial property. Usually FEMA just clears debris from private uh, residential structures and not commercial structures. And so one thing they could do right away is fill out that right of entry. They could go to the Disaster Recovery Center at Lahaina. They could go down to the county building and fill it out. Or they could go to that Maca uh, Maui, uh, 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 MauiRecovers.org website and uh, electronically you'll be able to do it there. That's going to be a significant cost savings to them on the rebuilding by being able to leverage that website. So there's a number of grants, SBA, other grants will be coming, but let me hand it over to the state. Uh, and then also there's uh, through um, other grants that may be out there through the state and a philanthropy and private sector that are available to individuals that have uh, business losses. Thank you, Derek Defendant, that was very thorough. On the state uh, side, we talked a little bit about it, the 12.5 million that's gonna go through MEO. Um, the council is approving the resolution that will allow the uh, the money to move over to MEO, and in uh, my discussions, which is once a week with Debbie Kabibi at M MEO, um, as soon as that money is approved, she's ready to go. The applications are all ready. Uh, they had a lot of experience during COVID, so uh, they know what to do and what not to do, and I'm um, in constant contact with Debbie and the, the mayor's office and the county council. Thank you, Jim. Bryce. Bryce Moore with KHON2. How many wildfire survivors have been asked to, or just have, left hotels to other housing, and do we know where they have gone? So the question from Bryce is around how many wildfire survivors have left hotels, and might we know where they have gone? I'll do a quick version okay. of that. Well, I'll tell you, um, so thank you, Bryce. Uh, at one point, we had 7,996 individuals in hotels. And then as of, I believe, yesterday, we had 6,879 people in hotels. I'll defer to even uh, more updated numbers um, from Bob. Uh, but you can see there has been some transition. And just, uh, again, to reiterate what the hope is, is that if anyone is out there in our state, in Maui, if they have a place they feel they could rent, 
make sure you contact our teams because we can, through uh, Bob, find a way to get a contract or to get the funds to people so they can rent. Our goal is is to utilize in a large way the mayor's visionary program to get people into households so there's resources to that family and a safe and comfortable place. But there's a lot of inventory out there that we hope to avail ourselves of. We want, over time, everyone to get into a condo, you know, an apartment that has a stable place where they can resume their life, a house. Uh, so anyone out there that would like to participate in the program will find a way. Uh, we do have, through the HHFDC program, over a thousand houses statewide. Uh, I believe it's about 700 on Maui that were already entered into our program. We just have to match people who are living in hotels with those properties. Yeah, as the governor said, this is really a collective effort uh, here. And uh, uh, what I see uh, is I really look at applicants or households. And so uh, I saw, I think the height was 4,105 households that were in the hotels. So 4,105 households where the governor gave individuals, uh, and not to totally confuse you, but that was on October 15th. Uh, I mean, on uh, August 26th. On, on October 15th, the height was about... 2,731 households, so that's a 1,374 difference in about 50 days. And so what's happening, where are they moving to? Uh, there's a lot of programs, as you're hearing today, that allows people to move out. Uh, some are on their own using our rental assistance and finding rentals. We can see four or 500 people have done that. We've also, we've already received 100 people have asked for that second uh, assistance of rental the next three months, so that's starting to happen. Uh, in some cases, it's family and friends, and there may be other programs here that's helping people move on. I, I think, as been said by the mayor and the governor now, what we really want to do is help people move to that much more stabilized, longer-term housing where they have kitchens, where they have washers or dryers, and those kind of things. So we're really focusing our resources in the case management and Red Cross's resources and other nonprofit organizations on how do we provide that. Why FEMA could provide rental assistance, maybe we can't provide the furniture that you may need to, to put in. Uh, maybe we can't provide a first and last month's rent. The good thing is by working with organizations such as Red Cross and CNHA and some others, they can do that. So we're trying to collectively work together as a coalition and work with each individual to understand their unique needs. Uh, do they have a pet, no pet, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, AFN, not, and meet those needs to help them uh, get back into a longer term housing. I'll just, I'll just expand on two more things. Um, this morning I was fortunate enough to be in a meeting with the Red Cross, with Gail and her team, and CNHA, and the program that they've set up with the mayor is, uh, is working well. There's 400 uh, families that are being assisted through a program and then <laughs> oh, the number went up from this morning <laughs> and it's it's an awesome I know we shared that information at another meeting that the mayor and I were at so you know a lot of people know that um, CNHA is there but they've been a real great resource and so I'm fortunate to have that uh, Hawaii fire relief program through HHFDC uh, the number is almost 500 uh, 450 individuals that have been moved into uh, the program and you know we're, we're trying to make sure that as many people as we can we put in those programs and as the governor said earlier it's on every single island so if they can't find work here if they can go to Kauai there's units on Kauai Big Island and Oahu so just wanted to add to that okay our next question comes from Audrey McAvoy with the Associated Press it is a question for Mayor Bisson Will the county be offering owners of vacation rentals incentives to convert their units to long-term rentals for Lahaina residents? If so, what incentives do you plan to offer? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we have talked about, of course, if you switch from a short-term rental to a long-term rental, that already impacts your taxes uh, because the short-term rentals are taxed at a much higher rate. Um, you know, we have some other plans that the governor and I spoke about yesterday that we'd have to take to the legislature uh, in trying to find, this doesn't exactly answer the question, but finding a way around our issue of uh, the short-term rentals that, that we have. Um, we're trying to incentivize folks by offering them not just rent that uh, different federal agencies are helping us with, but of course, 
I don't know how else to say this, but we're appealing to people's conscience. Is I don't know how else to say it, to see if they will do what we think is the right thing to help someone. If you have a vacant unit and you know there's a family that can use it, um, you know, we're asking nicely, and we're also offering a financial incentive. Talk about the rates. Uh, Megan, tell them I am Megan. I have a question about the reopening of schools. Um, I know that after the Kula Ash testing on the results were released on Sunday, some parents were really concerned. I was wondering if Lahaina had similar results and levels of toxins. Um, does the state and county have any plans for moving forward for the schools, especially during phase two and the demolition of the Okay, Megan asked a very thorough question. I'm just going to simplify it. The question is centered around um, as La schools in Lahaina have begun to reopen this week, um, there has been Kula ash testing that came back with arsenic. So Megan is asking for a status update on the Lahaina testing as it relates to schools. And Kiki, Mahalo, Megan. What I wanted to just maybe start off with before the governor answers a question specifically about Lahaina is that the testing is very much in line with other fires. So I, I don't want anyone to think that there's a significant difference than the fires in California, Colorado, or Oregon. Uh, the testing that comes out, this is what we expected. And I think you even heard Dr. Fink say that in one of his uh, interviews. So this is what was expected. This is why we've taken the precaution we've taken to have EPA come remove the hazards. Uh, it's why there's material around the fire area. It's why we are looking at soil tack. It's why we would wet the material down. We're, we've unfortunately gotten very used to dealing with large residential and commercial areas that have been destroyed by fires. And unfortunately, we've gotten pretty good at how to deal with that safely, especially when you have the community around them. With that, I'll let the governor answer the specific question about the schools. Thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, this is very important. We, you know, we anguished over this over the weekend, whether or not to delay the school reopening or not. Uh, so all of the tests around the schools have been negative uh, for any of these uh, concerning heavy metals, specifically arsenic or lead. There was one um, elevated number for nickel, which is unusual to see, and it's rarely a concern for people. Uh, we are doing samples twice a week. Uh, so we're testing the ash. We do anticipate the ash to be in line as similar, like um, Bob said, to the ash in Kula and California, because the chemicals that are used are used pretty much universally, like trying to um, knock back termites, um, some other chemicals in paints and so on. Uh, we're going to keep testing perpetually. I will say this, that most of the concerns about heavy metals are through ingestion. In other words, putting it in the mouth, eating... Um, um, specks of dirt or uh, paint chips, that kind of thing, which is why we usually worry more about around elementary schools because our keiki, the young ones, play more in the dirt. They put more um, soil in their mouth. So we're being very thoughtful about that, uh, but so far, so good. Uh, if we ever see any concern, we'll immediately take action. It was difficult this last time just because of the timing. Uh, because that data came in on Saturday, we wanted to respect everyone, so we made the announcement the next day and gave people the opportunity to know if they needed time to do research, it's okay. Don't have to take your kid into school yet. If you needed to wait for more testing results, which usually take about two weeks from each sample, that's okay too. Uh, but our Department of Health is quite good, and we're going to take a very conservative tack on um, public health questions. So it's mostly ingestion. It's not usually aerosolized uh, breathing questions where you'd see if the wind got up. Uh, having said all of that, the measurements in the air have been in the green zone, which means safe. And if we ever do get yellow, orange, and so on, red, maroon, we'll immediately move our keiki indoors and then take time to move them home. Uh, one thing I would say is it's very likely that the classrooms are amongst the safest places because we have HEPA filters, in the classrooms. We're able to seal the windows quite well. Um, so we're prepared for that, but we're not anticipating a problem. Mahalo for the question, Megan. Jeremy? <clears throat> Jeremy Lee, KITV4. Question about public trust. Last time we were in this room, the Secretary of Energy 
said something about 17 minutes is what it took to overtake the town. That was repeated on the floor of Congress. The Joint Information Center said they have nothing that supports that, nor has anybody who said it. So I wanted to see if we could address that. And again, in the interest of public trust, another question is about were there any other text alerts that went out for evacuation besides the 4.16 p.m. text alert that went out specifically for Kilauea Malka? That's on account of Okay, so that's, that's, that's a twofer, that's yes. Two okay, so I'm going to take the first. So remind me again, your first question, Jeremy, is question around the 17, 17 minutes. Point that went around mm -hmm. that the JIC has said they have nothing that supports that. Okay, so Jeremy is inquiring about the 17 minute time frame that has been stated in terms of how long it took for the fire to um, go the through Lahaina. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. The only thing I can say to that is there was a witness, his name is uh, Tracy Bennett, and he was interviewed by a national news agency, and on that agency he gave the time of 17 minutes. So if you look up Tracy Bennett on any video uh, account, I, don't, I can't remember the news agency, uh, it was uh, within the first week of, the, of what happened, he gave that time. I'll get to your second question, Jeremy. Yeah, uh, and, and in support of what the mayor is saying, one of the points of discussion was the speed with which the fire spread because of wind. And the wind was gusting, and this was what we recorded, at 74 miles an hour. And it was sending embers throughout the town. And as we know from the many people who were in the fire who did escape, they were sharing how fire was overtaking them as they tried to drive away from this one mile by five mile area. I don't think anyone is really debating the speed uh, with which the fire was spreading. I mean, it was spreading very quickly and it was overcoming firefighters, it was overcoming people. That's what was trying to be expressed. Now, when people talk about public trust, we're trying to be as open as possible. There were lots of discussions all across uh, media and social media about how many uh, people were missing. Well, we cast a wide net at first because any complaint we wanted to follow up on in those first days and weeks, the net had to be very broad because we didn't want any single name to not be followed up on. We didn't want any loved one uh, to not be recognized if we just had a first name or we had a nickname. So that was challenging because it led people to believe that there were more people that were lost. Now we we'll do our best all along. And if we ever find another name or, or a lost loved one or remains, we're gonna go through the regular process. We'll follow up with the genetics, we'll share it immediately, but we're trying to be as transparent as possible without deviating from science. Second part of the question was? Yeah, Jeremy, repeat that second question one more time. Yes, uh, so the time, we know the, it was called in at 254, but the text alert went out at 416 and 417 specifically to evacuate Kilauea Mauka, a three block by four block area, just Makai of the bypass. The question was, at, with the exception of that text alert, did any other text alerts to evacuate go out for Lahaina leading up to the 9.45 p.m. proclamation of the state of emergency? Jeremy's question is around um, text alerts that have gone out and whether or not there was an additional text alert outside of the 416 and 417 one that was sent out for Lahaina evacuees or residents. Yeah, as far as wanting the exact time, Jeremy, I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay? Thank you. But uh, was there another text besides the one that I mentioned? That's what I need to get back to you. Um, yeah. Thank you, Again, one of the challenges was uh, telecommunications were, were rapidly being destroyed, which is, you know, one of the realities. And uh, as you know, we've gone to great uh, pains now to assess everything. And that's, when we use the word investigations, most of that is investigating how we can better respond going forward, how we will use sirens, how we will use text messages, how we will use uh, satellite communications, all of these things. And what I can say is, uh, as we head into 2024, quite soon, with the new legislative session, our team is preparing a large package in support of 
not just Maui County, but all the counties for fire breaks, more technology, uh, more capacity to alert our people, all of these things. And we would actually uh, like to say that we are sharing our experience with other communities across the planet, other mayors, other governors, because they're facing a lot of the same concerns. So we're hopeful that though we've suffered terribly for, you know, for our community, that other fires can be um, stopped or other people can get more alerts, which is what you're allu alluding to going forward. This problem is not gonna go away. We are going to be wrestling with a dry planet, with heavy storms and need for resources, including fire, police, to protect people. Final call, I think we um, had everybody ask a question. Does it, wow, all right. Bryce, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, for the Red Cross, um, I've, I've talked to several people who are staying in hotels and there, there's a feeling of we don't know when we'll be forced out. They don't know if they're gonna get a knock on the door or a note or a call. How, how does that work? Is there a certain deadline where the Red Cross has to tell them that you have to be out by this point or could you just explain how that works? Bryce's question is around clarity regarding those staying in NCS, non-congregate shelters. Yeah, we are not asking anyone to leave until we find a permanent housing solution. So um, people are staying in those hotels. We're not kicking people out. We have a lot of resources looking at different ways to put people into homes, but we're the Red Cross. We don't do things like that. So if they do get a 48-hour notice, that means they have been? We did get, give a 48-hour notice for them to sign up with the case manager, not to leave. And we probably could have done a better job with that communications, but having said that, we are not kicking people out of these hotels. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's a super important point that Gail makes. If anyone, anyone feels that they're being pushed out, talk to your Red Cross worker. That's all. There will be no negative consequences at all for following up, none. In fact, the likelihood is they will not only help you find your next place to stay or keep you in your spot, but will also remind you that there is a grant or another program uh, or some significant resource that's available if you haven't communicated because we have some people that were very reluctant to communicate maybe because they were worried about their uh, citizenship status and maybe because they were worried that they had something in their past that might come out we're not worried about those things if someone has a citizenship uh, concern we're going to find resources in other places for them to be taken care of at the end of the day the conversations behind the scenes were more like okay someone have a disability don't even worry someone has a child, they're recovering, they've gone through a lot of trauma, don't worry. But for others, we wanted to make sure if they needed drug treatment or if they needed their medications or if they weren't getting enough nutrition, we wanted to make sure that they were touching base. Um, it also is a large resource question. We will spend billions of dollars, and that's, the, that's a good thing to protect our people, but we want to make sure they're in the right place for themselves and that we're referring them to a possible job. As you can see, we just hired over 100 people and I met with the, the new our local people that just got hired by the Red Cross. They were over the moon mm -hmm. to be able to help their brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, tutus. They are going to be deployed now also to make sure that that 48-hour question is just clear. Just come get help. Um, finding out if someone hadn't heard there were several units available that we will rent through Bob's program or the mayor's program. I mean, it's communication at this point. Uh, but I don't want people to be concerned. We actually are just treating this as one community. Chelsea? Yes, a question for Red Cross and, and maybe FEMA as well. But we have specific information um, from people who are staying at the sands of Kahana um, who are being told they must leave with little notice, um, but they have no alternative housing, according to them. Um, do you know what's happening there? Or what's your guidance on that? Okay, so the, real quick. So the question from Chelsea is around uh, clarity regarding the situation with evacuees at the Sands of Kahana. Mahalo, Chelsea. Give us a minute. Yeah, so I am asking Denise Everhart, who is responsible for our operation here, but um, I have a feeling it's a miscommunication of some sort. But if you have the details on that, it would be great. Thank you. 
So we had a conversation in the Sands of Kahana had some people that were staying there that weren't part of the NCS program. And when we heard about it from the governor and the mayor on uh, the morning coordination call. There's, 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 there's a Falls of Kahana and Sands of Kahana. Ah. I just want to make sure we're talking about the right one. Falls of Kahana was the one that wasn't part of your program. Falls, Falls of Kahana sure. was not part of our yes. program. And so we sent caseworkers <laughs> over to get them into our program and move them to another hotel. Sands of Kahana is one of our hotels. And once again, I'm gonna emphasize that people should talk to their Red Cross representatives. Sometimes some of the communication comes from other entities. Some of the communication can be misread. Talk to your Red Cross representative. Everybody who is in those non-congregate shelters has a Red Cross representative. I would add Thanks, Denise. The reason communication is so important is because in this case, one of one of those facilities, they had gone to their board after the state had begun to reopen, and their board said, "Wait, uh, we can only go a certain amount of time to allow for essentially short-term rentals." Was my understanding, not realizing that that was waived by the emergency proclamation, and this is, of course, an unprecedented situation. We don't expect every board to understand what we put into emergency proclamation. Sometimes we just have to share and communicate, which is why, once again, if you ever have a concern, and this was a, a very good example, a rare one of social media battles, but someone posted on social media a flyer. Someone texted it to me at 3 in the morning. By 4 in the morning, I was calling Jimmy and the gang saying, what is this exactly? And they were able to investigate with our local people fast, fast. And that way, people don't have to worry about moving. There will always be concerns until we've fully recovered, and that's going to take a long time. So uh, we know people will have to ask us for follow-up, and we will be as giving as possible. If someone in this group can't find resources uh, for individuals who've been displaced or hurt, I would be shocked. And then one final thing, because I want to take uh, multiple opportunities as we go forward to mention uh, how we're going to begin to help people recover. Expect significant announcements from me uh, in early November about funds for families who have lost a loved one or for individuals who were hurt in the fire physically. We are putting together a coalition to get them resources, hopefully in a much more um, expedited way so that they don't have to wait for a long uh, period of litigation. Uh, we know that there are going to need to be settlements. There have been tragedies and we want to be compassionate. So we will look at this as a recovery and humanitarian fund for those who suffered the greatest. I will give a lot of details about that and how people can uh, sign up and avail themselves if they lost a loved one. Uh, that will come in early November. I just wanted to add, if I could, Governor. Um, our focus uh, in the sheltering program at the hotels was a safe place to immediately uh, make available to those that were left homeless by the fires. Uh, the goal now is to move them to a much more stable, longer-term environment. So the calls they should be getting from us now are, what is your situation, what do you need? Do you need one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom? How can we help you get there? What are the resources? If you're one of the individuals that already received rental assistance from FEMA, uh, have you? why have you not been able to use that yet? What can we do to help you find a, uh, a solution? Um, so those are the kind of discussions we're having with them right now between FEMA and the Red Cross, uh, and, and how do we get you to a much more longer, stable solution where we can provide 18 months of assistance uh, through rental. Keep in mind, as I said in the beginning, we originally gave out two months of rental assistance. It's now, if you want to, one of the 3,000 plus people, which many in the hotels fall into that category, have received rental assistance and you find something and rent something, as long as you show that agreement, as long as you show that, that expenditure, you can come back to us and ask for a three month increment and we've raised it from 100% of fair market rental rate to 300%. That's almost over $1,000 more per month that we've added uh, to that. So we've, we've increased the money we're providing in order to meet the need here. So um, we want to make sure that we're working with you, we understand your needs and how to help you get to a much more stable, longer-term solution. We'd like to see you spend the next two Christmases in the same place, right? I'm in 175. If I said 300, I meant 175. Sorry. <laughs> That's why you saw my eyes. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, go for it. Um, Chelsea, there was uh, one property that I know of that had a 60-day maximum stay in a vacation rental. 
and the board at that property met. I talked to some of the board members. I talked to the president of the board. I could not understand why any association would have a minimum like that. The mayor, the governor, every single county in this state wants to put local people for a longer-term stay. Not sure why they did it, but um, the majority of the board members that showed up to a meeting uh, voted to not approve kicking people out because of a clause in their homeowner association. So I, I just want to clear that up. And so far, I only know of one property that had a situation like that. I'm not going to mention the name, but uh, it's not happening. <clears throat> Mahalo. I will take a final question from Paul. Thank you. Uh, and while the gentleman is up there, it's a public question for him. Okay. It's about the Jimmy. specifics of the MEO grants that are coming for these businesses. Can you get a little more granular? Uh, how much are they? What people have to do to apply? Who would be, which businesses would be eligible and not what that differentiation is? The question is around specifics regarding the MEO grants. Okay. So, as a state, when you know, we appropriate the grant. Um, it's the boots on the ground that's going to do it, which is the mayor, which is uh, MEO. So I know they have um, some uh, guidelines in place, but specifically the governor wanted to make sure that it was la the burn area victims first or survivors first. And then, you know, th th your whole island, the whole island of Maui is hurting. So. Uh, the governor wanted to make sure that even small businesses that are not in the burn area got the support. So uh, Debbie and I have had that discussion, uh, but they're going to come up with that plan, and as soon as the money's transferred over, we'll get you more details. I'm not prepared to answer all of the details yet, but I know that there's going to be uh, levels of in three phases that was a discussion two weeks ago, uh, small business, middle business, and larger size businesses. Um, I'm not going to say what the, the level of money appropriation was going to be because it may have changed based on the money that they have from not only the state but from different um, philanthropist organizations. All right, this formally concludes today's press conference. Mahalo for your time and please malama maui. Mahalo, ahui ho.